All right. Good morning, everybody. We are happy to start the series of the seminars for the new year. And we start with uh, an internal uh, seminar, so to say, in the sense that Antonis Nathanael will be speaking today. Uh, you see the title already in your screen, Short Gamma Ray Bursts as Binary Neutron Star Merges or Not. And Antonis, so we can start with it. Yeah. Okay, so let me repeat the title and then just discuss about the outline of uh, the talk. So the title is short gamma ray burst as binary neutron star mergers or not. I will first discuss a bit of uh, history of gamma ray burst detections and uh, how they were divided into classes, short and long duration gamma ray bursts. Then I will go and uh, discuss what was the consensus in the, in the literature and in the community before we observed gravitational waves, how people believe uh, what was uh, the central engine behind uh, short gamma ray bursts and long gamma ray bursts. Then I will discuss about the recent detection from 2017, a binary interest star merger that uh, also had uh, a short gamma ray burst accompanying the gravitational waves. And then I will discuss about research of today. So to begin with, okay. So this is a gamma ray burst light curve from the 90s. Okay, uh, we, has, we have a huge flux of high energy photons. You can see the background. And suddenly at uh, trigger time zero, you see that uh, this flux goes up uh, for almost uh, seven, eight uh, seconds. You see a double peak. This is a standard uh, gamma ray burst uh, light curve. This is very high energy photons. Uh, <laughs> this was a G, but we cannot see this is a PDF version of the talk. But uh, you can see the gamma ray sky when a GRB is triggered, the whole gamma ray sky goes blind and you can see only the gamma ray burst. So the whole gamma ray sky uh, cannot be seen, only the burst can be seen. So from the 90s, we started detecting a lot of gamma ray bursts. You see on the left, uh, a short gamma ray burst with a, a pulse almost a second, uh, a bit less than this. And on the right, a long gamma ray burst that you can see, uh, it has a duration uh, of uh, 20, 30 seconds. So from the beginning, we could see that a lot of, uh, not a lot, every and each uh, one of these gamma ray bursts had a unique light curve. So a small pulse, a bigger pulse, the previous one that I showed had a double pulse or a different structure. So every burst has its unique uh, details in the light curve. And again, this is only the gamma ray light curve. So only the very high energy photons that we can see for this duration. So from the 90s, a lot of, of these bursts were uh, detected from Batze. Also an important uh, result from this um, observation was that all these gamma ray bursts were coming from all the points, from all the directions of the sky. This was a hint that these are cosmological. They were not coming from the galactic plane. They were not coming from uh, galaxies close by. So from all directions in the sky, gamma ray bursts were observed. So this was a, a really important hint that these are cosmological. So at this time, we had a lot of statistics of these bursts. So in the vertical axis is the number of the bursts. On the horizontal axis is the duration of this gamma ray pulse that I was discussing before. You can see that they saw this bimodal distribution. So they cluster on the left a lot of bursts uh, with uh, a duration of less than two seconds. And on the right, you can see long duration bursts that start from two seconds and they can last till a thousand seconds or more. So from that time, uh, people started discussing why we see this difference. Okay, so there were some uh, understanding, some theory behind. And the theory at that time was that for the long duration burst, you need a lot of mass around the black hole. So something collapsed, a huge massive star collapsed, and you need a, a, a very large uh, deposit of mass around so that this accretes, this sustains the jet, and this has a long duration. For the short duration burst, people would say that this is a compact merger, maybe two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole. 
the accretion disk around the black hole now is a lot smaller, less mass to accrete, so this doesn't have a, a longer duration. This is the time of accretion. So this is the time that we see the light curve. People now say that, okay, this is connected with the time of accretion. We are not sure yet, okay. But this is just the duration of the burst. So the gamma ray pulse lasts for this second. There are There is more complex, uh, let's say, physics on it because I will discuss some of these things, but uh, you have accretion, but then you have a jet, but this jet has to penetrate to drill through some layers of the preceding star or whatever was before there. And then you can see the burst. So maybe the accretion disk needs to be a bit uh, huge so that you can have all this time to have this. Uh, phenomenon. So this is a slide from Neil Gellers. So this is the understanding. I think the, the slide is from 2005 around. This was the consensus at that time. On top, on the left, you can see again a light gear from a short gamma ray burst, just a pulse of gamma rays in less than one second. <clears throat> on the right, long gamma ray burst light gear, you can see two, three peaks and a more uh, detailed structure and uh, a duration of almost 40 seconds. And the difference at that time, we could see also some host galaxies at the time. So first on the right for long gamma ray bursts, all of these long gamma ray bursts were coming from star forming galaxies. Okay, we had a lot of long duration uh, gamma ray bursts that after some time a supernova was detected. So the collapsar model was well supported. What is the collapsar model? The idea is that you have a massive star of around 10 or 12 solar masses and more. Okay, the core collapses to a black hole or to a neutron star first, and then a black hole, and this gives you uh, the gamma ray burst. On the left, from the short gamma ray burst, there were from star forming galaxies, but also from non star forming galaxies. Never a supernova was detected accompanying the short gamma ray burst. So people were discussing that possibly there is a merger process behind the compact object merger. So maybe two neutron stars or a black hole and neutron star. So that was the consensus at the time. And the idea that we are almost sure that these are two distinct classes of events. Even from that time, observers started discussing, okay, how can we understand when we first see in the first seconds, let's say, of a burst, how can I understand if this will last as a short duration burst or as a long duration burst? On the right, what the plot shows on the horizontal axis is the isotropic luminosity. So this is something observed. You have to know the distance to know the luminosity. So all these bursts are with known distance, with known redshift. So they have detected the host galaxy and from this red, the redshift, so they can find the, the, actual, uh, the actual luminosity. And on the left is the peak, is the peak uh, of the spectrum. You see with black dots are the long GRBs and with red are the short GRBs. All of them show the same correlations. All, also the short lie in the same uh, manner like the long ones. So they don't see a lot of differences. I just included one plot from the study. This study is from observers and from a lot of analysis from the spectra, the details of its best, what they say, I have the quote there, indications point to short GRB, short GRBs being similar to the first phases of long bursts. As observers have told me, I mean, uh, speaking with them, is that when they start to see a gamma ray burst, it can be both. It has the same features in the beginning. If it stops, if it stops less than two seconds, then it is a short burst. If it continues and it has extended emission, then it is a long. So they don't have any other differences, any spectral differences, any energy differences, any cor correlations, luminosity, and um, uh, the peak uh, of the of the spectrum. All the other correlations are the same for long and short. So that was the idea that observers told us in 2009. Now, in 2004, this the Swift Observatory, now called Neil Gerrels, Observatory was launched. This was really important because at that time we could see only the first pulse of gamma rays that I was showing before. They were theories that if this first pulse is coming from a jet, then this jet will continue to propagate inside the interstellar medium. 
this will pile up a lot of matter, will make a shock in front of it, and this con will continue to give you radiation for a lo much longer time scale. So from theory, we would expect an afterglow. So something that will give you emission after the gamma ray burst and for a longer time scale. From this uh, observatory, this uh, the SWIFT observatory, first of all, you can check here, this is the BAT instrument displayed. So they can see, this BAT instrument can see almost half of the sky. So this was really good to, to detect the first pulse of gamma rays. And then just above this, you can see there are two smaller telescopes. So SWIFT is unique in moving really rapidly in space so that when they detect with BAT the first instrument, a gamma ray burst, then the whole satellite turns and can continue to detect X-rays for much longer time scale. So in the light curve that I show uh, behind, on the right, on the left, you can see that the first, the, the black dots, the black uh, crosses are from the BAT instrument. It's the first, the gamma ray burst pulse, the first pulse that we see. And then only in some tens of seconds, the whole satellite turns, and you can continue to observe X-rays for a much longer time scale till 10 to the 6 uh, seconds after the initial first. Just a, a small break here due to the rotation of the satellite around the Earth. Now, to, to have a closer idea, the first gamma ray pulse, this prompt emission, is the one that we were de detecting even before. So this is the first, the prompt emission of the gamma ray burst. This is the gamma ray pulse. We had this before, but now we see that we have a continuation of emission for much longer time scale in X-rays, in UV, and in other frequencies. And now, we can say more about this explosion. So if this was a jet and this indeed propagates inside the stellar, interstellar medium, we can now predict what will be the afterglow and check from observations um, if this is correct or not. Now, the standard afterglow model, as I was showing before, you can see here, this is just a conical, this is a schematic picture, but this is just a conical Jet, this is drilling through something. From the long, for the long gamma ray base, it is drilling through the, through the other layers of the star. For the merger process, when these two compact objects merge, they, ex they eject matter, so the jet has to drill through this matter. So when the jet drills and breaks out from the ejecta or the envelope of the stars, generally from the a mass distribution that is around the black hole, then the gamma rays can uh, be emitted and freely uh, come to the observer. And then if you see this part here, this jet continues to expand inside the interstellar medium. As it piles up matter, it starts to decelerate and at some point uh, spreading laterally. And then these will continue to give you the afterglow for longer time scale. So this is really important. What is the viewing angle? Are we looking inside the jet? So for the most of the GRBs, we were expecting that we are looking inside the jet. That's why we see and we observe the gamma ray pulse. But nowadays, we have seen events viewed <laughs> off axis, so from the side. And first, you see some gamma rays, and then you continue from the afterglow to understand what is the structure of the jet, and I will go to some details later. So till now, that was a brief, let's say, introduction and, and history of gamma ray bursts. Now I will stick to short gamma ray bursts, OK? What, is the, what was the consensus in the uh, literature? What was the observation that made us, made us sure that at least some of the short gamma ray bursts are coming from binary neutral star mergers? So binary interstellar mergers, for sure, when these two compact stars come closer together, the whole space time is constantly changing all the time and emits gravitational waves. We expected, at least from the theory part, that when these two merge and the black hole is formed, a short gamma ray pulse will come to us. And we expect a kilonova emission. Kilonova emission is just matter from this the neutron rich matter from these two uh, neutron stars will continue to heat up due to nuclear reactions and give you a thermal glow. And this is the, the kilonova. So I will show now a, a small video. It's the last, uh, let's say, 400 milliseconds before the two neutron star merge. And then when they merge, 
they produce a hypermassive neutron star, which is non-spherical. It has asymmetries, so it continues to emit gravitational waves till it reaches uh, either a point that it becomes a stable um, neutron star or it collapses to a black hole. Okay. Before I start, so uh, you, you can hear the frequency of the gravitational waves as a sound. And also uh, notice as these come closer together, they are tidally disrupted and a lot of matter is ejected. And this is done in a non-uniform way. So all these ejecta are uh, producing homogeneities in the matter distribution around the center of mass of this uh, uh, collision. And this is important. Now we see only the equatorial plane. So the time scale is in milliseconds, but it is run faster, almost a thousand times as seconds pass. So now this supermassive, hypermassive neutron star has formed and it continues to emit gravitational wave. So the first is the, 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 uh, the, the part that we expected that uh, we would observe from uh, LIGO and Virgo, the ground-based uh, uh, gravitational wave observatories. And then when this thing comes as a one unified core, this hypermassive neutron star, it continues to, to radiate gravitational waves and all these uh, inhomogeneities that it has. I have stopped this just to show you that there are places that the, the, the matter distribution is really dense, other places that is not so dense, and this is important in what I will discuss later. So this is the equatorial plane, but imagine that this happens in all directions. So also above here, a lot of matter is going around like this. Again, with places that are uh, Anton, yes. Do you know if this is a symmetric simulation? They have around only one half. No, this is not my simulation, and I don't know. It looks extremely symmetric. Yeah, uh, is uh, is typical in this uh, simulation to have only the one to cut one half of the round. Oh on one half of space. One half of space, yes. Like Sometimes one, yes, one half of space, yes. Okay, if it, it continues, it continues like this. It doesn't have the collapse to a black hole. And let me go back to the presentation. So in 2017, this thing that we hear before, this is exactly in the frequency time uh, map. Okay, this was the frequency that we were hearing before. And this was the observation that LIGO and Virgo uh, detected in 2017. This is the time of merger. Okay, you see that the frequency goes in other frequencies that LIGO cannot detect anymore. So they couldn't detect the continuation of the gravitational wave signal. What is really important is that 1.7 seconds after this, on top is the light curve from Fermi, a satellite that detects gamma rays. So 1.7 seconds later, Fermi detected a short gamma ray burst. And if you see the sky map, LIGO and Virgo gave us these two positions, and Fermi gave us that the short gamma ray burst was coming from this exact position in the sky. So a huge amount, I don't know, around 70 observatories around the globe, were pointing to that direction to find the host galaxy of this event and continue to observe it. They found it, of course, in one day or so. They found the kilonova observation and the afterglow from the Z of this event continued to be observed for more than 1,000 days from the actual merger. So what is the timeline of a merger? Below, I saw the gravitational wave strain and above, let's say, a physical image uh, simulated images of what is going on. So before merger, 
these two neutron stars come closer and closer together, so they have also interactions from their magnetospheres. And we may expect a precursor pulse, even before the gamma ray burst, something from the interaction of these two magnetospheres. And this is the gravitational waves that we expect to observe, and we observe them, at least in this uh, particular case. And it is maybe one, two, or, or maybe uh, seven to 10, I think, seconds that we can observe before merger. So this is the time of merger. The time of merger means that we have one single core. You can see it like here, a hypermassive neutron star. And if this continue to be a hypermassive neutron star, what I mean, it hasn't collapsed to a black hole yet, it will continue to give you gravitational waves. This gravitational wave uh, signal depends strongly on the equation of state, on the matter distribution, or how stiff uh, the equation of state is, how compact the start is, of how less compact it could be, and this gives you the gravitational wave signal. This is really important. We cannot detect it right now because it is in higher frequencies than the limit of LIGO and Virgo, at least today. At some point, if all this energy is radiated uh, away and the, the, this hypermassive neutron star cannot support itself from collapse, it collapses to a black hole at this point. So when this thing collapses to a black hole, we believe that the matter around it will form an accretion disk and a jet will be formed. This jet has now to drill from all, the, all this ejected material that is around the star in all directions. And when it breaks out from this ejecta, it will produce a gamma ray burst. All these ejecta, as I was saying before, from all these nuclear all pro all process reactions, it will give you a kilonova observed one, two days uh, later. And the afterglow, which is the jet now propagating inside the interstellar medium, will continue for tens of days and hundreds of days. And this is what we expect to observe. First, the precursor, maybe X-rays radio, uh, then mass ejection, and then the, the gamma ray bursts, gamma rays, X-rays, and continue to other frequencies. This was what happened in this first event. So the first part of the gravitational waves before merger, we detected them. No precursor, no post-merger gravitational waves. Gamma rays, 1.7 seconds after merger, we observed them. Then kilonova, optical, infrared, UV was observed, started from one day after the event and lasted a couple of days more. And then the radio X-ray afterglow, I think the first detection was nine days after the merger event. And then this continuum to tens, hundreds, and thousands of days we had an observation. So as I said before, there was a time delay between the gravitational waves and the uh, short gamma ray burst. It was 1.74 uh, seconds. In order to understand what is going on in the system, you have to assume, uh, uh, no, before you assume, you know that the time of merger and the time that you see the, the gamma rays, so the short gamma ray bursts. So in this time in, in interval of 1.7 seconds, you have first to collapse the black hole, to form a jet, the jet to drill through all this ejecta, and then to emit the gamma, ray, uh, the gamma rays that will come to the observer. So putting all these details uh, into play, we found that the hypermassive neutron star collapsed in one second after merger. Okay. So in order to model now this jet propagation, you have to uh, you have to do simulation. You have to do uh, magnetohydrodynamic simulation. Here I show a comparison of hydrodynamic jets and MHD jets. It is typical in the literature that people put that hot put by hand a conical jet to drill a matter distribution. So like this, you put the jet, it drills through the distribution, and then like this, you form a structured jet. And the structure comes from the interaction of the jet and the ejecta. On the right, I show an MHD jet. So we put the black hole, we put a matter distribution around the black hole, we put magnetic field and we just let it evolve. And the jet now is formed self-consistently. Okay, you just need to import realistic merger ejecta, you have to import a magnetic field, and then 
this will produce a jet and the characteristics of the jets are self-consistently from the simulation. On the left side, which is a hydrodynamic simulation, the opening angle is given by hand. So I put the jet, I put it three uh, degrees opening angle. So the opening angle is the half angle from the, from the axis. For, for the MHD jet, you just let it evolve and you find the structure of the jet. What we can see here is that MHD jets are much, have much larger uh, opening angle, 10 to 15 degrees, and they have a hollow core. So in color is the Lorentz factor. You can see that the Lorentz factor peaks outside the five degrees. This dust uh, white line is uh, five degrees. Another important feature in the MHD uh, simulation is that large portions of the accretion disk become ejected. So an MHD wind is launched, and a lot of this matter, if you can see here, is ejected. With the red line, I, I divide regions that are unbound, means that they will fly to infinity, and regions that are bound, that will stay to the system and eventually collapse to the black hole. So in the Hadri simulation, that you just put a jet to drill through this uh, matter distribution, only the jet can escape, and some part of the ejector, some part of the some some part of the matter distribution gains some uh, energy shock heated from the uh, propagation of the jet. However, the, the the most of most part of the accretion disk will uh, continue to be bounded to the system and eventually collapse to the black hole. On the MHD case, the whole the whole accretion disk launches a, an an MHD wind. Not only the jet here, which has really uh, low density but a very high energy and Lorentz factor. You can see here that the whole wind, this is not moving relativistically, but still it will leave the system, it will produce a wind. And this is important because this can contribute to the kilonova emission. So now what we were trying to find is this generic for MHD jets. What I mean generic is this, that they have really large opening angles and maybe a hollow cone in the in the middle. So what I plot here is polar plots from, let's say, is a zoom in to the degrees from 0 to 30, expanded to the whole quadrant. So from 0 to 30, and in each quadrant, uh, I have a different model. So in total, these are um, uh, eight different models, and it shows the Lorentz factor. So you can see that in all of them, the Lorentz factor peaks at, a, at an angle at five degrees and more, sometimes to 10 degrees or even larger. And all models, all MHD models have a hollow cone in the middle. So now let's go back to the, to the afterglow modeling of these events and how can we understand about uh, jet propagation? What are the details of this and how we can connect this with observation? This is work by Vasilis Biskegis for his PhD. So I was showing before uh, this video of these two neutron star uh, merging together, and you could see that there were a lot of inhomogeneities in the matter distribution. So till now, we, we had a lot of simulation of jets propagating through a homogeneous medium. We tried to do this in uh, introducing perturbation in the matter around it to see how this can affect the propagation of the jet. Let me find it. So in this video, uh, I will show the density distribution. It is one jet drilling through a homogeneous uh, matter distribution and one jet drilling through a matter distribution that has a lot of um, uh, perturbations. Okay. So on the right is the one with the perturbations. There are two things important. One, how the perturbations can affect the propagation of the jet. So the time delay that we see the gamma ray balls. So if there are more perturbations, maybe on the route of the, of the jet, then the jet maybe go faster or slower than the other case. And also how much of the energy of the jet will be given to this ejecta because they will also uh, radiate. 
So you see on the right, the jet that finds on its way more and more uh, of these density perturbations, it can propagate faster through this ejecta. And also at the end, you can see that the shape of this is much, much different and much more extended than the shape of the jet going through the... Yes. Again, a little confused. The previous simulation that you showed, you had a disk, a torus, and a jet. Where were the eject and what? How does, how do this eject compare to the previous simulations? You mean this? This, yes. Okay. So, there are one type of simulations that I was showing before that we start with two neutron stars. You just let the system evolve. Okay. They merge, they produce the accretion disk and the ejecta and all of this self consistently, and then they collapse the black hole. The numerical cost for these simulations is enormous. You can just simulate some milliseconds. And the simulation that I showed, which is not mine, is a really huge one. We saw around 30 uh, uh, last orbits. Uh, before merger. Now, what we can do here is take the space time of the black hole and put by hand a matter distribution around, okay, a black hole. And this is the ejecta and this is the accretion disk. So matter close to the, to the black hole is the accretion disk, matter further away, maybe with a velocity of 0 0.1, 0 .1, uh, the speed of light, or the speed of light is the ejecta. So in this picture, there is no explosion and nothing is ejected during around the black hole. The ejecta is part of the jet or the what? The ejecta and everything is self consistent So the ejecta, there wasn't uh, uh, an explosion before. Yes. We start. So in time zero is a matter distribution. Some part of the matter has a velocity, an outward velocity, mimicking the ejecta yeah. of and the real explosion. And you continue to update even more ejecta what? from the aggression disk itself. How about the other simulation? In the next simulation. One more question. Yes. <laughs> Shall I take questions for me? Well, uh, it is uh, not for long, but yeah. answer the first question the answer. So, in this simulation now, okay, we just wanted to see the effects of this perturbation. So now we go further out from the black hole, we don't glue it, and we put jets by hand just to drill through the ejecta. So we put a matter distribution. They have an outward velocity of 0 0.1 C. So all so these ejecta this will continue to expand, even a jet was not there. Where did this ejecta come from? From, from the, the merger. From the previous simulation? Uh, okay, now we're just mimicking. We are not importing anything from the previous simulation. We just take a distribution that mimics the ejecta from the realistic simulation. And just we inject the jet to see. So the original, the large simulation had as a result ejecta. Yes. Even before the formation of the black hole. Yes, this continue to eject. And as long as the hypermassive neutral star is alive, it, con it continues to eject matter. So now the idea is to take this matter. Till now it was taking as homogeneous matter distribution and you let the jet to drill through this. And now we try to add perturbation in the density to see what will be the effect. Before we continue, let's check uh, if there is Dinesh uh, Kazan wants to ask something about the thing. Yes. Okay, let's uh, let, uh, raise the hand. So, uh, Dimo, yeah. uh, so there is an issue here. You put an MHD. How much magnetic field you put in there? Uh, How much flux, magnetic flux? Or is it only toroidal flux? So in this simulation, you mean? Yes. So in this simulation, what we've seen from numerical relativity simulation with two neutron stars, is that the magnetic field really, uh, the magnetic energy in these simulations is going up at the time of merger and uh, the magnetic field should be around 10 to the 15 Gauss or so. So here okay. in the simulation, we put by hand toroidal field of 10 to the 14 Gauss and poloidal field of uh, the same or a bit less strength. Okay. 
And in right. total, the magnetic energy uh, in the beginning of the simulation is 10 to the 49th ergs. Oh, these are parameters you play with. Yes, yes. So in principle, you can put higher field if you want to, or lower for that matter. Uh, lower, yes. Higher, it, maybe it's not expected to go higher than that. Oh, don't you magnify the toroidal field by rotation? Uh, this will will be done in the simulation by itself, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. I don't want to interrupt anymore. Yeah. So the basic parameters that we played here is just the ejecta mass and the jet luminosity. Okay. So what we found on the horizontal axis is the luminosity of the jet. On the vertical axis, on the uh, left plot, is the jet breakout time. So depending on the luminosity of the jet and the amount of mass that you have behind, of course, this time uh, can uh, change a lot. So the, the red one is the smallest ejecta mass of 0 0.01 solar masses. The black one is 0 0.04 solar masses. And the blue one is 0 0.1 solar masses. So from the event that we saw, uh, computation so compared with the Kilonova explosion is that we had 0 0.05 solar masses of uh, ejected mass. So if we had even more, you see that the low luminosity jet of 10 to the 49 ergs per second has no uh, jet breakout time. So it didn't break out at all. The jet was lost inside, lost all its energy trailing through this matter distribution and couldn't break out. Now, if you lower a bit the, the ejecta mass to 0 0.0 follow solar masses, you see that even the jet that has 10 to the 49 air conversation can break out, can surpass the, 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 the ejecta, and expect to, to give you a, a gamma ray burst. On the right, uh, we plot the, the opening candle of the jet. Again, this depends if you have a lower matter uh, uh, ejecta mass with the red one and a very uh, luminous uh, jet, then this can have a larger opening angle close to seven, eight degrees. Now, I want to stop a bit and discuss what is the jet and what is uh, the so-called cocoon in the literature. So the jet is drilling this matter distribution really close to the axis. You put it by hand in an opening angle of three to five degrees. And then when it breaks out, it, it takes its own uh, made from the simulation and gives you the expected opening angle. As this drills through this matter distribution, it gives a lot of energy uh, to this mass, and this is called the cocoon. So all this shock that you see here, this will continue to propagate outwards. So we can compute how much of this mass will become unbound and how much of this mass will surpass the actual ejecta. So if this surpasses the actual ejecta, this will also give you radiation. And this could also give you a, a pulse that would mimic a gamma ray burst. So here, we just take the energy from, from the cocoon. On the right is the energy per solid, uh, per solid angle. So you see that even in an angle of 25 uh, degrees, the energy ca can go close to 10 to the 49. So even if we are viewing the system off axis, we could see a gamma ray pulse. Okay, and this is the importance of this cocoon feature. So you are not looking at the jet, you are looking parts of the ejected material that uh, got a lot of energy from the jet, and now you are looking at this point. So about the afterglow again, as I was saying before, you have on the left, the jet is drilling through the matter, First, you have this prompt gamma ray emission that I was telling, and then the afterglow emission. Depending on how you see the system, so if you are looking straight on axis, zero degrees straight to the jet, from the beginning, you can see almost the whole of the jet. Then if you have a small uh, viewing angle, you just again see the jet and parts of the jet. And as in time, the whole jet will decelerate, you will see the whole of the jet. But then if you are going off axis and more off axis, at some point you will not see the jet in the beginning. So you are really off axis, you missed the prompt gamma ray emission of the jet, but maybe you saw an emission from the cocoon shape, and then 
you will continue to see an aftergrowth from the cocoon. And when the jet decelerates enough so that it is, uh, you are inside its cone, you will see also the jet after some time. So how this is translated in afterglow emission? This is afterglow emission. This is flux in, in radio on the vertical axis and time duration in times. So on the left is one of our models with luminosity 10 to the 49 and an ejecta mass of 0 0.01. The purple one is just four degrees uh, viewing angle, observing angle. So you see that in the beginning, you observe almost the whole of the jet. Parts of the jet, of course, they are uh, boosted <laughs> and they are uh, you cannot see. But after some days, you see that as this decelerates uh, slightly, you can see the whole of the jet. And then you continue to see the whole deceleration of the jet and this is the continuation of this power law in time. However, if you are, if your viewing angle is much larger, in the beginning you don't, you cannot observe uh, the jet itself. So this emission ha comes from the outskirts of the jet, from the cocoon emission, and then as time goes by, at some point the whole of the jet has decelerated. You are inside the cone. At this peak, you can see the whole of the jet and the whole of uh, the jet structure, and then these continue to decelerate in the same manner. On the right, I have a different model with more uh, ejected mass, more luminosity, five times 10 to the 49 and a 0 0.1 uh, solar mass is ejecta mass. What is really important here is that when you observe these solutions of axis, the perturbation in the density is really important of what will you, uh, you will observe. So. In these colors, you see that maybe you can be here, maybe you can see here. So the cocoon is really important here. And the perturbation in the density has a really strong effect in the cocoon emission. This is the afterglow from this event, this gravitational wave uh, binary interstar merger event that we observed till a thousand times. And I have uh, three different models, a viewing angle of 21 degrees. I have off-axis perturbation, on-axis perturbation, and a homogeneous ejecta matter. You see that on-axis perturbation gives you a different um, uh, evolution of the emission in the first days of this event. So in the next event or in any event that we will observe in the future, it's really important to take into account what is going on and how the cocoon gets all this energy to give you this uh, uh, first emission in the first uh, uh, days after the explosion. Okay, so for the last part of the talk, I will try to connect gravitational waves and jet disk properties. So about I will discuss about the, this one uh, binary interstellar merger and the gravitational waves we observed, and connect them with all the uh, distribution with all the short gamma ray bursts of known distance that we have till today. So on the left is just uh, posterior results from the LIGO-Virgo analysis. This is the tidal deformability. I don't want to go to details. Uh, smaller tidal deformability is more compact. Higher tidal deformability is less compact. Uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 is the tidal deformability of the two neutron stars. It can be different because the two neutron stars can have different masses. Lambda delta is the tidal deformability of the system. OK, and this is an important parameter. So when we do numerical relativity simulation that you can see on the right, you put two neutron stars, you put the equation of state that you have in hand. This gives you a different tidal deformability. And then after merger and after you have a black hole, you can measure the disk mass. So on the left plot, on the horizontal axis is the tidal deformability. And on the vertical axis is the mass of the disk that stays around the black hole. So you do the simulation. And each point on this diagram is a huge numerical relativity simulations that at the end, you just measure the mass of the disk that is left around the black hole. So now, if we, from the gravitational wave event, we knew that lambda tilde and we know that is around these values, you can have an idea of what is the, the disk mass of the event, what was left, let's say, when the black hole was formed in this specific event. Note here also that the upper limit for disk mass is 0.4. It's less than 0.4, but we put it to 0.4 solar masses. 
So there is no numerical simulation with whatever equation of state we have in hand that can produce a disk with mass above 0 0.4 solar masses. I will use these values, that's why. So accretion is really important. Accretion will sustain the jet and everything is connected. The disk mass is connected with the best duration because you need this accretion for some time in order to have your jet to be alive for some time. And also it, all, it is also connected with the ejecta and the kilonova emission because some portions of, the, of this disk will give the kilonova emission. So if the disk is really small, it will not give you the kilonova emission. So Salafi and Giacomaggio in 21 took these two parameters. So from this plot, they took the tidal deformability from the event and they translated to a distribution of disk mass. And then from the analysis of the jet itself from the afterglow, they took the energy distribution of the explosion. So now we can define an efficiency. It's the energy of the jet divided from the uh, mass of the disk. So this is not time dependent. And they just found this uh, black line is the distribution of the efficiency of this explosion. You have the amount of mass that was around the black hole and the amount of energy that you took from the explosion. In a similar manner, we find um, with black with uh, red, sorry, is what they try to do, and then with um, with blue, we just put more information about the jet. They uh, took the energy distribution only for hydrodynamic jets. Here, we just put some MHD jets, but even using their their own accretion to energy, I want to go to the next re result. So we took all the short GRBs with known uh, distance. Known distance is important so that you can have an understanding of the luminosity of the birth, and you have the duration of the GRB. These are observables. So for each short GRB, you know the duration of the burst, and you know the luminosity. In uh, We have to assume the jet opening angle. We don't know it, but we put a distribution, and, and we find the distribution also for this. The ejecta mass is unknown, but it is correlated with the duration because you know the, the, uh, the, the time of the burst and you can estimate how much ejecta was produced. And we have to assume also a time from the collapse to a black hole. And this is for all the other short GRBs that we have observed. So for example, for one short GRB, this specific case is this one. You can see the name on the right, this short gamma ray burst. We are using, we are assuming that the accretion to energy efficiency is the same with the one binary neutral star merger that we observed. This is the strong assumption here. We assume that also for this event and for all the short GRB events that we are here, the energy, the accretion to energy efficiency is the same as the event we observed. And from his, from this analysis, we can have a posterior distribution for the disk mass, assuming that this was a short gamma ray burst from a binary neutral star merger. Okay, I hope it makes sense. So now in this, uh, in this diagram, on the horizontal axis is the time of the burst, this TGRB, this is an observable. And on the vertical axis is the luminosity of a GRB. So each point here can be, uh, so each red dot is a GRB with these two parameters. And behind in color is the, uh, the M disk from our analysis. However, here we just use the mean value from the distribution. From the analysis, we have a whole distribution for each. So for two parameters, for a luminosity of a jet and a duration of a burst, you have a whole distribution for M disk. To plot this here, we just use the mean value, the median value. Okay. And then on top of this, we plot the GRBs that we know the distance, the short GRBs that we know the distance and we know the luminosity. And here is the limit that we have of 0.4 solar masses that comes from numerical relativity simulation. And as we found all these short GRBs, in order to give you the same efficiency in energy as the one that we observe, have to have much larger disk masses above the limit that we have seen in numerical relativity simulations. So if we translate this 
in per sentence of incompatible observations. Incompatible meaning that they cannot they, they can't be produced from by binary interstellar mergers. Why? Because we don't expect a so huge accretion disk. So with blue, we take the lower part of the mass distribution. With red, we take the mean of the M-disk distribution. And with black, the higher um, part of the distribution. As you can see, even in uh, with the, taking the blue one, uh, at least 20% of the short gamma ray bursts, we believe that either they were not from binary interstellar mergers or that a different mechanism is working for these events. And that's it. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, time for questions from the audience here. Your simulations are three dimensional. So, for the simulation of the two neutron stars merging, these are 3D with some symmetries. With the, for the simulations for the jets that I showed are 2D. If you believe that you may use some information, you use the third dimension. Yeah, yeah, you lose a lot of information. Uh, one information that uh, at least one uh, problem that is known is when you have one jet uh, drilling through a matter distribution in two dimension, a lot of matter piles up on top of the jet and this cannot live from there in your simulation. Whereas in 3D, it has it can go like this, so it can penetrate and it can calibrate the system. This is a known result, yes? Okay, and uh, I have another question. When you, the, the merger of the neutron stars uh, passes through the phase of the mass, mass injection, mm -hmm. uh, then you, you believe there are some elements that were created in the star during the lifetime, for example, gold or something. That's yeah. projected, like they say, in the space. Mm -hmm. This is the only way that we can find, for example, these uh, heavy elements uh, in yeah, space. Yeah. So, yes, I didn't put any information about Kilonova. Uh, yes, so the idea is that during merger, as you said, we have a lot of mass ejection. Mm -hmm. This mass now is very neutron rich, and we will have our process nucleosynthesis. Mm -hmm. But this is not instantaneous. This is happening in, in time. So maybe this will come in, uh, so in one, two days, this will be heated a lot and it will produce uh, the kilonova emission. But all these elements to be produced, it needs even more time. But, but it's the only way to find, for example, some- So from the solar abundances uh, of these elements, uh, we expect that most of them are, are yes, so produced uh, through mergers, yes. The role of the surrounding uh, ISM has been uh, checked. I mean, it is not necessary that we have a homogeneous uh, medium yeah. that the jet propagates uh, inside. So, for the jet propagation of the, for the, the element jet. production? Well, for, actually, I'm asking for the jet. jet yeah, yeah. So, uh, for the jet propagation. So, as it accumulates, as you have shown, uh, mm -hmm. uh, then can be more or less or some different. So, the, the amount of uh, mass in the interstellar medium is just a parameter when you model. Okay. Uh, this, so uh, what can be the effects on the observables if you have, let's say... A, so the, the idea is this, if you, have more, uh, if you have more interstellar medium, yeah. you cannot see very far away the afterglow. If you have less... Uh, through, yeah, yeah. Okay. It is easier to see it from further away. Again, in relation to your result that some fraction of this works, it not, does not come from a two-star merger. If you go to the original distribution of Kubeliot in 1993 uh, and you plot two, let's say, Gaussians, one next to the other, you show the original. Yes, of course. Here, if you draw two, two distributions, then one enters the other. Mm -hmm. The right part enters. Yes. Up. You mean if I continue like if this? Continue, continue and if I continue like this? Also. Yeah, yeah. Does this 20% estimate agree with this? Yes, it could agree. And also, uh, this is a plot from 1993. There is a plot, I mean, yeah, from, two, plot. You know, from 2020, is that it is almost one distribution with a bump on the left. So yes, yes, maybe 
So yeah, they are in their content. How do people believe that, they, that it is one distribution or that there are two distinct effects as we discussed? Because the theory was telling us that short GRBs come from compact binary mergers, and we have seen only one in gravitational waves with the short gamma ray bursts. Now people, uh, let's say, before this detection, people were saying, okay, maybe they are the same. We see a burst and we it's the same like a long. If it stops, now it's a short. But suddenly we had this detection, and indeed, from a binary and resonance measure, we had a short gamma ray burst. So nowadays, it comes again back in time and says, yes, maybe it, it is totally a distinct, a distinct theoretical, let's say, background. One is a merger, the other is a, yes. Some, it's the collapsal model. It's so it's a massive star of 10, 12 or more solar masses, and this collapses. So nowadays, again, this is more, let's say, the consensus. Okay. Actually, I will see there is uh, one question yes. from Guilherme Lazanas again. Yes. Yes, they, uh, it is generally assumed that what we see in gamma rays comes from a relativistic outflow. That, in your case, is it outflow relativistic of your? Yes, yes. All of the outflows that I was showing were relativistic. Like what Lorentz factor? Depending the simulation, in the last ones of... Uh... Oh, the one you fit the... Uh... Oh, seven, seven, uh, yeah, yeah. The one that I was showing the fit in the afterglow, the Lorentz factor is uh, 300. I can check, I mean, in the simulation to tell you. Okay. I, I think it's around 300, the Lorentz factor. And, and the radiation comes as synchrotron? Uh, for the afterglow, we assume that the radiation has synchrotron from the shock, from the jet and the interstellar. Okay, no, for the prompt emission. We don't model the prompt emission. Oh, you don't model. Okay, fair enough. So the afterglow is just simply have the electrons. You use the electrons in the outflow. It's the interstellar medium that's swept by the outflow that gives exactly. you the... It's the outflow swooping up the interstellar medium and in the shock from you accelerate electrons. And it's so it's the jet, not the... Uh, well, I guess you show that. In some cases, you have the... Uh, cocoon that interacts but this in this particular case it wasn't the cocoon it was the uh, uh, jet that interacted with the interstellar medium so actually it is both the first part is the cocoon that because when you have a large viewing angle and you are 30 degrees in the beginning in the afterglow what you see is the cocoon and as the jet decelerates and the Lorentz factor goes down then you see also the jet Okay. Uh, the interesting thing about this particular afterglow is that the radio, the uh, optical, and the x-rays, they have followed the same evolution. Mm -hmm. yes. That is not seen in any other afterglow, as far as I know. Uh, that has to do with the uh, position of the observer relative to the outflow. Maybe. And maybe this is the only case that we have seen in such a large viewing angle. Usually, typically, we are looking for, I mean, we expect that all these gamma ray bursts we have seen, we were observing straight inside the jet. But for this specific one, we are sure that it was off axis, in in my understanding, more than 25 degrees. In the literature, people believe around 16 degrees. So yes, I think it's the only one, the only burst that we are sure that we observe it off axis with a large viewing angle. And what is the value they assume? 16? I thought it was larger. Okay, I have a plot here. So, so from the literature, this is, I think. So the the observer angle. Okay, oh, when decreasing we decreasing with time. It decreasing with time because we had more observations, and oh, okay. the observations and the 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 the, the, the superluminal motion in two thousand eighteen. If we put all this together, the viewing angle was expected 16 degrees. But these are hydrodynamic simulations assuming an opening angle of 3 degrees. If I put here our MHD jet, yes. The viewing angle for us is uh, 35 degrees, 32 to 35 degrees. Okay. All With right. the hydro jet is 16 degrees, I think. This is the consensus in the literature. And all that depends now on the magnetic field you willing to put there, which now 
but so what if you take the... another another gamma ray burst with small luminous, then that means the magnetic field was higher. Um, not even with the same magnetic. I mean, the energy, the kinetic energy of the jet. Okay, the magnetic field distribution. I mean, you put it toroidal, poloidal, and uh, the strength will give you a jet. Then this jet, I mean, you have uh, now to calibrate it because when you do an MHD jet, a GRMHD simulation, Good. this is, uh, I mean, uh, this is scale free. Then you have to put the uh, the black hole mass. So a different burst maybe has black a different- hole mass, I don't think the black hole mass is relevant in this case. It no, no, has to, to set to the scales, to set the scales, I mean, the amount of mass around the jet. Oh, for the size of the- The, the size of the- max. Yes. yes. Well, uh, in this case, in your case, how much is the, the black hole mass? Five solar masses? No, no, no. It's 2.8. I mean, assuming that the hypermass... 2.8. Okay. This comes from the gravitational wave. Yes, yes, yes. 2.8 and the, uh, and the uh, disk is 0.4 or less than 0.4. Yeah, okay, less than 0.4. Okay. Okay. So let's... All right, Andrew. That's very good. I, uh, I'm learning. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. No. So okay. So thank you very much again. We meet next Tuesday. Bye bye. Stop share. Stop share. And.